Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Seth Joyner Show. I got a special one for you guys today, okay? Today, it's all about the Diddy, the godfather of sports in Philadelphia, my colleague, my friend, my mentor. Hey, listen, it's all about... Now, we're going to talk some Eagles just a little bit as the show unwinds. But my good friend, just in case you guys didn't know, let me give you the rundown. I got a long list here. So the guys in the back, they're just going to have to sit still for a minute. And Ray, you're just going to have to receive these flowers as I hand them out. Okay. Um, after 53 years, Ray Dittinger is calling it quits. Both TV, writing, and the radio. Now, I find it hard to believe knowing how much this guy loves sports. Um, but I think it's time that he and Maria just ride off in the sunset and do some things that they really want to do. Um, you're talking about an author. He wrote a co-wrote seven different books. And Ray, you can correct me if I'm wrong when I bring you in. He's a radio personality, um, a sports writer, started off his career at the Philly Bulletin, the Philly Daily News, um, TV personality. He's one of, you know, been my colleague for the last five years at NBC Sports Philadelphia. And we were just talking via email yesterday. He was telling me how much he learned from me as far as football was concerned. And I just had to let him know how much I learned from him, how to be a professional, um, you know, how to conduct yourself with class, um, the detail that he showed to the work that he did, how to be professional. Um, he didn't think I was watching, but I was watching and learning all along. Um, let me see. He's a senior sports, a senior producer at NFL films. I didn't know that until I started doing some research. He won four Emmys, um, as a writer and a producer at NFL films and Turner network, um, uh, for a series called football America. Um, his awards are numerous over the years and over the decades we're talking um, in 1995, the Dick McCann Memorial Award, um, he won the Pennsylvania Sports Writers of the Year Award five times, the Keystone Press Award six times, Associated Press Award for column writing three times, um, Pro Football Writers of America Award for feature story in 1991, and he's a Pro Football Hall of Fame writer. He's a Philadelphia Sports Hall of Fame writer. And just recently, the winner of the Reds, Reds Bagnell Award, Lifetime Achievement um, at the Maxwell Club. Um, and Ray, I had an interesting conversation with a gentleman, you know, back from that 60s, 50s era just a couple of weeks ago. Um, but to help me on the Seth Joyner show, send Ray out in style, um, there's two people that's worked with him the most that probably know him. I, I'm just going to go out and, and assume that they know him the best. That is the guy who's done radio with him the last few years. Um, you guys know him on WIP as um, Glenn Mack now. And our colleague and leader over at NBC Sports Philadelphia, Michael Barkan. Okay, gentlemen, how are you today? Seth, it's absolutely a pleasure to see you tonight, and I'm honored to be part of this tribute. Back, same, back at you, Seth, and agree with Glenn. I'm just so proud and pleased to be here. Thank you. Listen, I'm thrilled that you know you guys had the time. You, everybody's got busy schedules trying to pull all of this off, um, but I'm gonna bring in the man of the hour, uh, the man of the day, the man of the year. Um, and give him the mic and let him say what he wants to say for a little while before we kind of roast him a little bit. I want to reminisce. I want to remember. 
I want to reflect. I want to do it all in this hour um, because this guy means that much to me. I think he means that much to everybody. Um, I think that he's a Philly icon. I think he's a Philly treasure. And um, most of the time, we don't get the opportunity to give people their flowers while they're with us. Um, so I'm going to relish this one today as I bring in my man, the Diddy. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. Um, that was quite an introduction, Seth. Thank you very much. And I got I got to tell you, it has been um, it has been an absolute delight uh, the last five years doing uh, Eagles pre and post with you and Michael and Barrett. It has been uh, it's been a it's been a real joy uh, and an education. And, um, you know, even though I feel good with my, about my decision to retire, uh, I'd be less than honest if I didn't say that uh, those I'm going to miss those Sundays. I'm going to miss those Sundays with you guys because it was that much fun. Well, listen, there's no doubt about it. You know, I don't know where I'm going to get my information from, you know, at the spur of a moment, Michael. Join the club. You know, don't every look at single me. time. I call every Glenn. Time, every single time that I need some information, you know, hey, Ray, you know, back in the second quarter, you know, in that second possession when they ran this play, you know, who threw the ball, who got the sack, you know. Uh, hold on one second. He starts flipping through that those pads, and the next thing I know, oh, there it is. And sometimes he'll give it to you before he even – has to look at the pad, Michael. Yeah, when I think of Ray, uh, I think of the three Ds, diligence, devotion, dedication. And there is nothing that keeps him from his appointed rounds, as mm. they say of, uh, of the postal delivery people. And he just, every single Sunday, Thursday night, Monday night, he is like clockwork and nothing keeps him from that. And I don't know, sometimes he's carrying in a big fat hoagie and I look at it, my mouth's watering. I, I'll have mine and you know me, Seth, I'll start right into it. And I'm thinking, how is that man not eating right now? Because the game's on. That's why. And he's taking, I'm like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get it from Ray. Uh, so, but he is unwavering in that dedication and devotion to the sport and to his craft. And, and I think that is, is truly remarkable, and, and that's what holds me in awe of the man. Nothing keeps him from doing it the right way. Hey, Glenn, you know, Michael said sometimes he comes in with the hoagie, but my recollection is every <laughs> single Sunday he's got a Wawa hoagie and a bag of chips. It's like clockwork, man. I mean, it, it's, it's – you know, yeah. being able to see, being able to see that routine every single Sunday, I'm 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 gonna miss the football, but I'm gonna miss walk watching him walk in, you know, with his rain jacket, his brown rain jacket on, and that brown bag. <laughs> and, and here's what I'm gonna miss, guys. I'm going to miss the array that goes over the desk of the of the yellow legal pads, and the newspaper clippings, and the books and the magazines and the entire library that he has at his disposal and uses. Now, most people I know use one of these. It's called a cell phone uh, or an iPad, and they keep their information on that. But Ray is not going to do that. He He's not just old school, Seth. Ray built the old school, and it's worked for him for all these years. And it's very endearing just to see all of the notes and all of the display. The I'm afraid that companies like Staples are going to go out of business when Ray retires <laughs> because who's going to buy all those yellow legal pads? Well, Ray, I can I can say this, you know, I've watched you for five years do it all on pen and paper. I can imagine the collection of notes and pads and things like that that you have at home. I asked them one day, guys, you know, Ray, what do you do with all of this stuff? He was like, oh, I got file cabinets at home. He's got to have about 30 file cabinets in his basement or something where all of this stuff is. And, Ray, listen, I know that you're retired, but we need to figure out how to um, gather up all of that information, find a company who can transcribe it, you know, and document that stuff for all time. Because <laughs> there is, you know, people don't realize, for every single year that Ray's been in the business, he's been breaking down players in the draft. I mean, it was funny. One day he pulls out, you know, a, a player evaluation on Barrett Brooks, you know, that's just spot on. 
We just showed it, in fact, in, in his swan song show on Bird's Huddle on NBC Sports Philadelphia. <laughs> we just showed the pros and cons yeah. in Ray's right. own hand. Right. Yeah. Barry I mean, Parker. People look at it. People look at Ray and think that he's this statistician that keeps all of these copious notes. You know, if I can steal that from you, Michael, every single game. Um, but what they don't realize, he is just a sports and particularly a football junkie when it comes down to it. The guy sleeps, it, eats it, drinks it. And I'm wondering, you know, how? You, what are you going to do to get your fix, Ray? <laughs> well, I'm still going to watch the games. Um, a lot of people have asked me uh, sort of to to Glenn's point about uh, the yellow legal tablets. What's going to happen to Staples? What's going to happen to the paper industry when I retire? Um, fact of the matter is, I, when I'm watching the games now, even though I'll probably be at home, um, I'm going to have the yellow legal tablet and I'll still be char I'll still be charting and logging every play of every game. Because at this point, after 50 years, I don't know any other way to watch a game. I mean, I, I have to be I have to be logging all that stuff, or I feel like I'm genuinely not watching the game. The funny thing about the Barrett Brooks thing that Michael mentioned, um, Seth, you're right. I have my scouting reports on guys going way, way back in the '90s, and they asked me today when I was getting ready to come on and do the show on NBC here, um, was there any chance I could bring some of those papers? And by any chance, that's a long shot, but by any chance. Do you still have your original scouting report on Barrett Brooks when he was coming out of Kansas State? And I said, oh, absolutely. I could put my finger on that right now. So they, I brought it, and they showed it on the show. And uh, as a parting gift, I gave it to Barrett to take home with him. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know what he's going to do with it. But uh, I, <laughs> he asked if he could keep it, and I said, yeah, okay. Hey, listen, Ray, that report is going to be um, – that's going to be a, a a a valuable document down the road if he just frames it and makes sure that he takes care of it. I mean, how, how many guys get the opportunity to see that, let alone, you know, be able to have it in their possession? Um, you know, I, I'm going to tell you right now, it's good to know that you're going to be watching the game. And you're still going to be taking copious notes. Um, Michael, I'm just trying to figure out. I may have to go down to cricket and get him a cell phone <laughs> and send it to him so he could text me during the game. <laughs> well, so I, you we know can, what? Because I need that information, man. I, I don't know about Glenn, but I have spent several different occasions trying to convince Ray or at least get from him why he has no cell phone. And he he doesn't like the technology, he doesn't want to be bothered, he 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 doesn't want to be reachable. I get all that. He, he does have a computer, although his wife is beautiful, lovely wife. Maria sets that up for him, but he can zoom with the best of them. But I said, Ray, Maria loves you. We all love you. Just say you leave here one December night and there's a blizzard. And God, God forbid you spin off the road. You're, you're OK, but you spin off the road and you need help. I said, if you had that thing at, like it was a brick in your trunk. Would that be so bad if you then went back there and took it out and said, hi, honey, I'm going to be a little late. And by the way, call AAA. Glenn, I'm sure you've done the same thing. <laughs> I, I have I have on a regular basis people who come to me and say, hey, tell me the truth. He actually does have a cell phone. That's just a bit, right? Because nobody in the year 2022 actually doesn't have a cell phone. And I go, no, no, it's true. The best story, and Ray can tell it, is when he was stopped by a cop for talking on a cell phone. <laughs> true. Yeah, true. Well, tell the story because it's so great. Um, I was on Route 295 in New Jersey, driving home from our remote at uh, Delaware Park Racetrack. I went over the bridge into Jersey cause to pass 95. So I'm on 295 and I'm driving. And all of a sudden, I have a state trooper in my rear, rear view mirror, lights flashing. I pull over. He comes up. He says, I guess you know why I stopped you, right? And I said, I have no idea. And he said, well, you were driving while talking on the cell phone. And I, I started to laugh, uh, which is not a good thing to do to a state trooper because they tend to take that personally. So he said, oh, you think this is funny? And I said, yeah, I kind of do because I don't own a cell phone. <laughs> and he, he began tearing my car apart looking for the cell phone. I said, you, you, I tell you, I don't have a cell phone. I don't own a cell phone. As it turns out, what it was, 
was kind of a bad driving habit I have. I sometimes drive like this. You know, I'm 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 driving like this. And he just is and he just assumed that nobody drives like that unless they have a cell phone in their hand, which of course I didn't. So anyway, he takes my driver's license and information, still not believing my story, and he comes back and hands it to me and says, Okay, I recognize you. I've heard the story. Yeah, you don't have a cell phone. Have a nice day. <laughs> Yep, two ninety five. I'll tell you something else. There, there, there is a um, a retired sports writer from the Philadelphia Daily News, uh, whose name I I will not mention, but we all know who he is. And he did not have a cell phone. And basically, we told him, if you don't have a cell phone, so we can't get we we can are unable to get a hold of you. You can no longer do television for us. We need to know if you're going to be late. You got we got to be able to call you. And P.S. He went and got a cell phone. Ray never got a cell phone. Nothing. We never threatened him with squat. <laughs> Actually, if I am correct, Ray was given a cell phone. Yes. By Comcast. Yes. And it remains in the original packaging to this day. Yes. That's Don't. true. When I when I came to work for Comcast, part of the deal, if you came to work for Comcast, is they gave you a cell phone. And so when I walked in the newsroom, they actually did it as a formal presentation. The boss came out and everybody stood around in a circle and they handed me the cell phone and everybody applauded. And they said, are you going to use the cell phone now? And I said, no. Nah. And it, it still sits in the box today. Amazing. Amazing that, um, you know, in this ever-changing world that someone sticks to their guns, not only, you know, from the cell phone perspective, but also from the perspective of, you know, his work, you know, because it always... It, it always dumbfounded me that, you know, that he had all of these, all these legal pads. And I'm like, Ray, you know, there is a computer, you know, that you can talk to the computer and it will transcribe everything that you want to write down. Um, but if that's his way, then that's his way, you know, and I, I respect it because the one thing it's taught me how to do, you know, even through all of my years of training and trying to learn how to document my information you know, during the season leading up to a game, um, I don't think it was ever as as detailed. I mean, when you when when Ray hands you a piece of something that he wrote, it's detailed to the umpteenth. I mean, there is nothing left out. The down isn't right. The field position isn't is the, the, the down isn't wrong. I should say the field position isn't wrong. Um, who got the ball and who threw the ball and who ran the ball, who caught the ball. Those dynamics, you don't look at Ray's writings, Michael, and see a couple of scratch outs, you know, where he made a mistake. It's always precise. Yeah, yeah. And that beautiful uh penmanship, which was I'm I'm sure no learned no doubt at St. James High School among among other fine institutions of learning. But it, it is. It's it's he, you know, I call him he's a, he's got a big brain, Seth. Glenn, I think we'll agree. It's just like you know, and um one of the things I always say is that it, it's like information goes in it just does not come out it is locked in there for all time and it's accessible like it. he's got a supercomputer it, his right. his recall is astounding um listen i i'm younger than ray but uh not as I, I know i'm not quite as sharp as i used to be and sometimes i'll try to remember a name from the past and um someone will come up to us during the show it just happens all too often and go like ray 1957 Eagles had a backup running back. What was his name? And Ray was like, oh yeah, you know, Biff Barkowitz. And and he'll he'll know every guy, every number, every stat, which goes back to the great stories that Ray tells about being a kid riding on the bus yeah. with his grandfather to the game and having the old men quiz him on the uniform numbers. And that's a habit, uh, the 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 recall and the attention to detail is a habit that stayed with this man through life and has served him well. And being at Big Ray's bar, being at his grandfather's bar and being yeah. propped up there, right? Come on now, give us all the no roster numbers. You can do it, you know. And, and uh, but but uh, if I could, Seth, one of the one of the things that makes listening to Ray and Glenn together such a joy is because it's not just about football. They've written books together. Uh, they talk about everything under the sun, which I love. And you know, you're driving around on Saturdays. Sometimes it's difficult. Uh, that, to me, that, that's what defines a great radio program is if you don't want to get out of the car 
and you don't get out of the car because the topic matter is so strong. And they, they can be talking about theater. They can be talking about movies. They can be talking about other sports than football. And it's always interesting. And um, uh, I remember once, Glenn, you might have been involved uh, with this at one point, but Ray and Maria are involved with the, what, what is the dog, um, the, the dog charity, Ray, is it Paul? There, yeah, there, there are two of them. We're involved with uh, uh, Heaven Sent Bulldog Rescue, which is uh, for abandoned bulldogs. And the other one uh, is Pals for Life, which is Pals for Life, which is therapy dogs, you know, taking them around to hospitals yeah. and nursing homes. So we're at Pals for Life. And I had emceed it in this case. I think Glenn was unable to make it that year. And, and I, I emceed it. And Maria and, I, Maria and I are sitting at the table at the end of the thing because they called Ray up and they said, if you have any questions for the Hall of Famer, Ray didn't, you please. So, so Ray starts taking questions and predictably they're about the Eagles. Some are about other Philadelphia sports teams. And one woman raises her hand and says, how do you think the Detroit Red Wings are going to be next season? And I just said to Maria, if he freaking answers this question, you're going to pick me up <laughs> off the floor. And Ray said, well, you know, Steve Yeiserman, I guess, is I'm like, I'm out of here. I'm going to get my car. Really? I couldn't believe it. I, I, you know, and that's him. And that, that's that's the radio show, too. It's great. So, <laughs> you know, I to say that. it's amazing. I'm so, sure Glenn has his own examples of that. Yeah, and I'm, I want to ask Glenn about about it, but I'd be remiss if I didn't go back and, you know, I left out um, Ray's screen, screen, the screen right that he has to play Tommy and me. If you guys haven't seen it, it's a must see. Um, it, it's a, oh, we've seen it. The question is how many times have we seen it? <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm, I'm really speaking Michael to, you know, cause we've all seen it multiple times. Um, I'm speaking oh, to, it. you know, the, the viewers, if they haven't seen it, you've got to see, you know, this rendition of, you know, the true story of, of Ray's friendship with Tommy McDonald and how he helped Tommy um, ultimately, you know, get into the Hall of Fame. He rightfully deserved it. Um, but you guys have got to check that out. Um, Glenn, I will ask you because you guys have a uniquely different um, radio show. Um Normally, when we dial in the WIP, we're, we're there to talk about the Eagles, the Phillies, the Flyers, or the Sixers. Um, you turn that show on on Saturday morning, my goodness, you might get anything from um, movies to, um, I forget the segment. It's almost like a where are they now? Or what, what, what's it called? This week in Philadelphia sports history. Yeah. Yes. Well, this week, and, but but the other one Tell is, me your story. Tell us your story. Tell me, Tell, tell, tell us your story. Um, yeah, but you've been a guest on that. Yes, and and I had I had a blast coming on, kind of giving my you know story from Spring Valley, New York, to you know the Philadelphia Eagles and beyond. Um, Glenn, give give everybody an idea of what it is that makes the Glenn McNow and Ray Didden just show work so well. Well, it's very nice of you to say, and I really appreciate it. And um, really what that is, is kind of an evolution of getting to work with a guy who's one of my best friends. Uh, and so I think when we started it 20 years ago, it probably was like most other shows, which is we would bring up a topic, give our opinion and take callers. And that was kind of it. And then Ray and I realized that mostly what we enjoyed was just talking to each <laughs> talking to each other. And... Um, we eventually realized that listeners kind of enjoyed Ray and I talking to each other because it was the opportunity to kind of sit in a coffee shop or in a, in a brewery or wherever, uh, pull up with a cup of coffee or in Ray's case, an enormous diet soda and just kind of <laughs> hang out with two guys. There it is. And hang out with two guys who could talk about whatever we want, you know, we, we felt like, which is sometimes, TV and sometimes is food and sometimes is what we're doing, just kind of what guys talk about. And the thing I would say that kind of is the most fun um, and, and kind of makes it unique is in 20 years, Ray and I have never run out of things to talk about with each other. Um, there's never a moment in the show where we've struggled and, and tried to conceive a topic because it's a slow sports time. Let's do this hot topic to make people call. 
we just have a good time hanging out. And um, I appreciate what you say in this work. The Tell Us Your Story segment, we started when the pandemic began and there was no sports. And Ray and I thought like, okay, what are we going to talk about now with no games? And we realized we had a, an opportunity to do something you don't get to do in radio often, which is a long form interview. And we knew a lot of people. You were one of our early ones, Seth, Dick Vermeil, Larry Anderson. Uh, and then we did some guys we don't know as well. And for an hour, we just talked to them and get their story. And, and I, I'd love Ray to speak to it, but it's just a rare thing in radio to be able to do that kind of long form interview. Yeah, it really, it, it really, yeah, it, re it really is. And uh, the one thing, and, and we wound up doing what, 108 of them, 109 of them. Yeah. Just something, something like, like that. that. Uh, and they were all different, all different sports, men, women, some, a lot of local athletes, but some not. Um, uh, and um, the one thing that I found in every one of them, even though we did a lot of research and preparation for the interview and kind of knew what paths we were going to walk down in the questioning, there was always a surprise. There, in every interview, in everybody's life story, there's always a surprise. Uh, and sometimes they just really, I mean, took our breath away. I mean, I remember, and Glenn mentioned Larry Anderson, the uh, Phillies' terrific broadcaster, you know, we, we started every one of these. Well, tell us about your family. Tell us about where you grew up, how you got to play in ball and everything. And Larry started talking about growing up in Oregon uh, and then uh, told us something that we didn't know. Uh, and nobody knew except the people, except the people. In his, he said, you know, my father was an airline pilot and he was killed in a plane crash. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, as much as we've as much as Larry Anderson, as long as he's been in this town, which goes back to the 80s, and as many people know him as both as a player and a broadcaster, nobody knew that. Nobody knew that. And when he told us that that happened and he was just 13 years old uh, and had to grow up without a father, getting that shocking call in the middle of the night that there's been a plane crash and your father is gone, um, having to overcome that and go on with your life, it was a really compelling part of the story and gave you a whole different, a whole different look at how Larry Anderson, who he is and how he grew up. But, I mean... The, Almost every one of our interviews, and over a hundred of them, always had something in there that you weren't expecting, but somehow took the whole story in a direction that you never, you never imagined it was going to go. See, Michael, this, this, this is what I love about Ray, because in that short, concise synopsis of the interview with Larry Anderson, he just told a story. I mean, I think that's what everyone loves about Ray Dittinger when he starts talking about whether it's, you know, a sports situation, something outside of sports. He has this natural ability to like take you into that moment, take you into um, that scenario and really give you a lifelike experience of, you know, really what went on there. And not everybody has that, the ability to really do that. Yeah. The ability to tell a story and have it be captivating is special it's unique, um, and uh, I don't have it, that's for sure. And I think Glenn <laughs> and Ray both do. I mean that, Glenn. You know, the way Ray, it, it's it, he has a natural way of kind of taking you along on the story and providing the parentheses and providing the flashbacks or the foreshadowing, anything that's needed, and it's extemporaneous. It, yeah. really, it really is incredible when he does that. And we were just in the tribute we just had for him on NBC Sports Philadelphia, we were talking about, and Ray had the nerve to say, "Oh, I thought I, I thought this might get brought up," and it was him uh, who was talking about meeting Christy Brinkley, the supermodel in New oh. Orleans. And uh, uh, if you know Ray, you know that story, and know Glenn and Seth do. And and he 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 told it so well; it was on tape. And then I guess he kind of talked about it a little bit more when we came back from the from that segment, but. Uh, look, he's smiling right there. Is a you know, I can't believe he bypassed lunch. He, he, he's with blushing, Christy Michael. Yeah, he, he's blushing. I think anytime he thinks about that, he blushes. <laughs> we did a. Um, he should. <laughs> we, we did a uh, again during the pandemic, right? There's no games, so we're you know, like we're coming up with features, and we did a feature um, every show for geez a year uh, called the Didinger Chronicles, which was just. It was the easiest thing in the world for me because I would just start a segment saying, Ray, tell us about the time. 
And then I would sit back for 15 minutes and Ray would tell the Christie Brinkley story or the time that Muhammad Ali put his fist to Ray's chin or all these amazing stories about Ray's interactions and the characters and the places he's been, the, the Reggie Jackson story and just all of those. I got a year of programming out of that, which coincidentally, Ray was at that time writing his book of memoirs. So it worked out well as a marketing thing for him. But the number of people he's met, the interactions, and by the way, not just meet him to shake their hands, but mm -hmm. had these amazing stories with him. It's 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 10 lifetimes of of riches. Yeah. Ray you know what the other, the other thing is, Seth, I'm sorry, um, is that Ray. And I said this at the Maxwell Awards, and I said it uh, the other night when when um, he announced his retirement with Glenn, and we were on after the Phillies game. He he does not judge people. He might judge players, you know, from a professional perspective, but he is he doesn't talk about people behind their backs. He doesn't talk about anybody. He's not like that. And in a business where that is prevalent, to see that is a is a beautiful thing. He he is just as honest and as kind. Uh, as they come, but also do not, you know what the saying goes, do not, uh, uh, you know, misinterpret kindness for weakness. And we were on before Super Bowl 52. You were on the show too, Seth, oh. where we matched up against Boston writers and Boston announcers. And, and I was a host from uh, Philadelphia and Mike Felger, who I wrote for the Herald at one point, I don't think the globe was a host for Boston sports, uh, NBC sports, Boston. And um, Albert Breer, who I guess was then with NFL Network, also from Boston. Right. And they started talking about Philadelphia fans. And you can say what you want about Ray Dittinger being impartial and, and unbiased. You don't talk about Philadelphia fans. You don't talk about his hometown in that kind of way. And he took them. He thumped them eight ways till Sunday. And I was stunned. <laughs> it, was it was a thing of beauty. And somewhere on Twitter, it is there. It exists. And that's what's that's also within in Ray. Don't mistake kindness for weakness because it ain't there. It's an old football term, you know, when you get beat down on a Sunday afternoon, you got taken out to the woodshed. Yeah. He certainly he certainly took him out to the woodshed. He sure Ray, did. you know, and in 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 regards to a 53 year career, you know, and Glenn, I, I wanted to piggyback off of what Glenn talked about the amazing people that you met, the amazing people that you had the opportunity to interview and actually get to know. Um, give me your five most impressionable people um, that you had an opportunity to either write about, to interview, um, or spend time with, get to know really, really well. Um, doesn't matter from what era, from what genre whatever it is I, I think people would be really curious to know that after hearing what glenn just said uh, okay um there's a no particular order um but muhammad ali um i only interviewed him once uh, but it was just him and me alone in a log cabin on top of a mountain uh in his training camp um where he uh <laughs> He looked me in the eye, and I, we were talking about Joe Frazier, uh, and uh, he said, "Did you uh, do you see my?" He had only fought Frazier once at that point. He said, "Did you see my fight with Joe Frazier?" I said, "Yeah, I did." Uh, he said, "Where?" He said, "I went to the closed circuit in Philadelphia, saw it on the screen," and he leaned across the table and put his nose right up against my nose and said, "Who was you rooting for?" <laughs> now can you imagine being that close to muhammad ali and he's staring you right in the eye and he asks you that question and the answer was joe frazier of course it was <laughs> what was his reaction uh and his, his reaction was total shock uh he rocked back in his chair uh and uh, he didn't get angry he just seemed surprised uh, and, and what he said to me was, why was you rooting for Joe Frazier? And I said, well, you know, I'm from Philadelphia. It's a, I'm just rooting for the home team. And Ali looked at me and he said, you know, I respect you for telling me that, which, I mean, I thought about that, Seth, I thought about that for a long time, the whole drive back. What, what did he mean? 
you know, respect, respect what? That I wanted Frazier to kick your butt? What? But, but the more I thought about it, I think what he was saying was, I respect that you had the guts to look me in the eye and tell me something that you knew I didn't want to hear. Uh, and that, I mean, I've done, Seth, I've done a thousand interviews, maybe 2000 interviews in 53 years, but that's the one I think I'll always, always remember. Uh, and the other people on your list, maybe at, at, you said a top five, Dick Vermeil for sure. Uh, probably the greatest coach I've ever been around and one of the finest human beings. Um, I would put your former teammate, Reggie White on that list. Um, Reggie, we all know what a great football player he was, but I got to spend time with him off the field in North Philadelphia, working with your friend Herb Lusk at Greater Exodus Baptist Church and seeing the work he was doing in the community and then going down to North Carolina after he had retired and having him show me that he was studying Hebrew to get a deeper understanding of the scripture. I mean, there was a there was so many layers to Reggie White uh, that he's one of the most fascinating one of the most fascinating people uh, I've ever met. And probably the other one rounding it out would probably be Dr. J, because I I never was around anyone who was that famous uh, and yet wore their fame with such grace. You know, I mean, everywhere traveling with the Sixers back then, everywhere you went, every hotel lobby you walked into, every arena you walked into, there were hundreds of people waiting to touch Dr. J. I mean, he was that big. Uh, and he handled it so beautifully. He had time for everyone. He was gracious with everyone. He was patient with everyone. Uh, and I once asked him, how did, how do you do it? I mean, how do you do it day after day after day? And he said, you know what? It's just easier to be nice. And he was, he was, he was that way with everybody. So that would probably be my list, Seth. Wow. No wonder I've been a, a, um, uh, Dr. J fan my entire career. I can remember way, way back in the AVA with that big fro, him and George <laughs> Gervin and and Michael Thompson. And, you know, what you just said, it's easier to be nice. Um, that's something that my mother lived by. She used to always say, she said, if you don't have something nice to say, you don't have something good to say, don't say it. It's easy to be nice. Take the high road. Um, but I don't want to disagree with your mom, Seth. And I don't want to disagree with the guest of honor here, but that's what makes your mom so special. And that's what makes Ray so special because it's not easier to be nice. It's easier to just, you know, boom, give him a little elbow. Being nice requires restraint. Being nice requires discipline. Being nice requires that you get more with sugar than you do with vinegar. And if you got a hot head, like some people that, are, you know, like sitting right here, it's, it, it's not easier being nice. So, you know, hats off. Uh, to Mama Joiner and, and also to to the Diddy because I, I think that's a tall order for a lot of people. And, Michael, uh, don't yeah. don't 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 get me wrong. I, I didn't say <laughs> you know I'm, I'm I'm an unfinished product even at 57 years old. I'm an unfinished product. You know she was trying to plant those seeds in me, and at times it, they bear fruit and you get flowers. Other time you get thorns. You know it's just it's just the way that I'm wired. Um, Interesting. I, I want to say one thing because Ray's being nice is great for Ray, but it has at times been tough for me. And the reason is because, and Michael and Seth, you guys may have experienced this. When you're traveling with Ray, you're traveling with Mick Jagger. So everybody's going to stop him and talk to him and ask him a question and want to have an extended conversation. And Ray is so nice that he's not going to say, okay, nice to meet you. I got to go. He'll engage with them. And I'll be looking at my watch thinking, we got to do a show in three minutes here. And the guy's saying like, so Ray, you remember uh, when you were at high school and, and, and I, and, and because Ray's so nice, I got to be the heavy sometimes. And I got to say, pal, it's really nice to talk to you. I got to pull Ray away from you. We got to do a show. So, I don't know if you guys have ever had to play watchdog there, but I've yeah. played that role more than a few times. Sign when he's at a book signing or whatever. Oh uh, gosh, yes. Yeah, forget about it. You can. Yeah. And Mick Jagger is right. You are right, Glenn. He's and that's the beauty of Ray because he has no clue he's Mick Jagger. 
Yeah, and Glenn, I, Glenn has tried. Lord knows he has tried, and he's been very good at it. But I'm just a little slow on the pickup. I mean, that's just a, that's just the simple that's, fact of it. I remember, time, there, yeah, Glenn will say to the guy, or Glenn will say to me when some guys kind of got me cornered. Glenn will say, "Hey, you know, um, you got a, you got that thing, you got it," and he's trying to get me out of there. And most of the time, I'll say, "Huh." What thing? What are you talking about? And then, then he just throws up his hands and walks away. <laughs> That's true. I, I try. I, I will tell you this. This is that Ray, but that is what makes you beloved. Okay. Because I've seen it at the other end of the spectrum from, from athletes. I've seen guys, you know, like my good friend Charles Barkley. Charles will he will kiss the baby, he'll take the photo, he'll sign the autograph, he'll, you know, he'll take the picture, the whole deal. Okay. I've been places with Michael Jordan, like we play golf. I play golf with Michael Jordan and he will take his golf cart and he'll ride down the middle of the fairway, all 18 holes. Because once people find out that he's on the golf course, they're coming out of their homes. He wants no interaction at all, you know? And what happens? People love, and listen, people love Michael Jordan because of the great football player he was, a good bas great basketball player he was. People love Charles because he was a great, you know, basketball player, but they love him because he's just real all the time, you know, and I've seen it on a lot of different occasions where people are like, you know, you stand there, a guy will stand there and he'll sign the autographs. He'll take, he'll, he'll take the pictures. He'll hold the baby and smile, even though he's got to go. And I always say it only takes 10 to 15 seconds to make somebody's day. You don't want to walk away and have people pass the word along that, you know what, that guy, Seth Joyner, he's the biggest a-hole in the world. He didn't even have three seconds. He couldn't even, like, he couldn't even shake somebody's hand, you know. That was always my position. But I'm telling you, that's one of the reasons, Glenn, why Ray is so beloved, because he's got time for everybody, even yeah. when he doesn't. And people remember those interactions. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned Barkley, and there was, uh, I'm, I'm going to interrupt the tribute to Ray just to do a quick tribute to Barkley. Uh, I was in the Atlanta airport, um, I don't know, 10 years, 12 years back when they played the NCAA finals there. And Barkley, I was on the same flight as Barkley. We were waiting in the terminal, and people start talking to Barkley, and he starts conducting court, making jokes, and asking people's names. And those people will remember that incident mm -hmm. with him forever in a positive way. And Ray similarly has the same way that if you go out of your way, you don't even go out of your way, as you say, Seth, you just do the right thing. Right. And people will remember that 25 years from now. They'll also remember if you're mean to them 25 years from now. So well, as Ray does, it makes more sense to be nice to him. I, I couldn't disagree more. I mean, I couldn't agree more. Um, okay, so I'm going to end this, this show a little early, but I cannot end it early without us talking some football, okay? Um, this might be the last time that I really get a chance to be on the screen, you know, with my That's guy cool. again, just talking football, unless I, you know, have him on here. I'm not going to bug him too much because, you know, that's what Maria is trying to snatch him away from, to get him <laughs> away from all this busyness. Um, but I am going to call on you throughout the year, at least you, once or twice. Yeah, right? Seth, you, 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 you know, you can call me anytime. So I was reading an article today um, that Jimmy Kaminsky wrote um, that someone over at ESPN had a bone to pick with Harry Roseman for giving up um, three draft picks in order to move up two spots in order to get Jordan Davis. Um, and it was really interesting because the majority of the people, you know, even some of the pundits on all the other sports networks, they believe, and I believe, you know, that the Eagles all oh, hit it out the park. I mean, they hit it out the park. I mean, Howie Roseman was like, you know, Merlin, the wizard on, I mean, just wheeling and dealing and moving and, you know, players falling to him that, you know, we probably should have drafted in the second round you know, or the third round, we just went right by the guy. Um, but there seems to be some people that believe that the Eagles made a big mistake because they gave up a fourth and two fifths to move up two spots to take Jordan Davis. I'm going to go around the horn. I want to start with Ray. Ray, what do you say? 
I'm okay with it. Um, I, but I'm a big Jordan Davis guy. I mean, I, I guess if you have some questions about what you think his pro prospects are, if you have some questions about how good an NFL player he's going to be, you know, then maybe you'll, you'll look at that price and say it's too much. I don't, I mean, I, you know, Glenn, well, Glenn can knows this. He can vouch for this. I mean, he heard me this entire football season. All I ever did, whenever we talked college football, all I talked about was Georgia. Uh, and it wasn't because of their offense. Their offense was good, but their defense was great. Uh, and it really started with Davis and Dean. Uh, and I thought they were just two really special players. Um, and if the Eagles had tried to stay at 15, I, I guarantee you the Ravens would have taken Davis at 14. Uh, so if – if your idea is to try and build up the defensive line uh, and try and do it around a true nose tackle, which is what I think they're going to do this year, I think they're going to morph into more of a three-man, three-four kind of look, then you go get the player who fits that best. And if it costs you a four and a couple of fives, I'm fine with that. If he comes in and he can have the impact that I think he's going to have, that price is not going to seem too high. Michael, along that same line, um, I've expressed concerns. Um, there are people who aren't that concerned. And I think the, to Ray's point is how you value Jordan Davis and how you see him in the scheme of what you do. I think my issue with Jordan Davis is the question of, can he be a three down defensive tackle? Can he, um, I mean, he spent what, four years, three or four years at Georgia, he's got seven career sacks, okay? I think when you move up the way they move up or you pick where they picked him, he's got to be a three-down guy. So he's got to evolve and turn into that guy that can stop the run on first, first and second down, yet stay on the field and third down and get it done as well. Um, it's a passing league. It's not so much a run league as it is a passing league. Um, so therein lies, you know, the, the the question whether he can do that. And my biggest question is not whether he, can he do it or not, because I think as a college player, what, what happens sometimes is you kind of get pigeonholed as a player. These coaches on the college level are concerned with winning national championships and winning so that they can maintain their job. And sometimes these players don't get the development that they really need. I think that 341 pounds is way too heavy for him to play at the pro level. I believe if they can get him down to 315 to 320 and I would buy him a jump rope and a ladder and work <laughs> on his feet every single day and find, if it's not Tracy Rocker, then go find somebody to teach this big guy how to rush the passer. Because if he can turn into that dual threat, then he begins to remind me of another guy, you know, who played defensive tackles for the birds who could do it all number 99 jerome brown if he can do that michael well i think that he can do that my money is on him that mm -hmm. whether he loses the weight or not watching georgia as i did watching his film as i have watching his um uh what the thing in uh what the heck they have in indianapolis uh, combine. The, combine. the combine i mean are you kidding me the guy is a specimen and i think he's one of those players that might actually be better. There's some guys who, when they play within a system, in particular in college, that the system kind of dictates how much they can be themselves. And I think once he gets to the NFL, I think all bets are off on what his upside is. Also, double team. I mean, the, how many guys, even in the NFL, are his size and his weight, Seth? He is a monster. He's got to be bigger than Jerome was by a lot. Oh, yeah. Right? No, okay, no, no. By a lot. And I, I would venture to say, all due respect to Jerome, that he probably is, is faster than Jerome, too. And Jerome had some speed on him. But if you look at the number of tackles for loss he had, you look at for the number of the times, and I realize his sacks were limited. Quarterback thought he had gotten away. Oh, no, you don't. I, I hope his fingers are strong because how many times do you see him get a guy by the jersey and just not let him go? So I'm excited to see what he can bring. I think his athleticism and his speed and also his personality. He's got an outsized personality that matches his physical size, and I think he's going to play just great in Philadelphia. But we got to see it done. Uh, with that, I'm sorry I've got to go because the Philadelphia Phillies are playing the Seattle Mariners. It's going to be an exciting game. Maybe when people see this and replay, 
um, they'll go look up the score and see what it was. But I'm going to say the Phillies are going to win it tonight, five to two. And by the way, I've rarely said this on on you know a live broadcast, but I love you all. That's <laughs> nice to see you, Michael. Appreciate all right. you. Oh, I don't know what I do. Thank you, Mike. See you later, Ray. Oh, you know Thank what? You. I'll be right next door, Ray. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, Seth, when you're talking about um, is he going to be a guy who's going to evolve into somebody who rushes the passer? And, and maybe he will. And I understand what you're talking about, the size. But maybe the comp with him is somebody like Lodi Nada uh, or, or, or Vince Wilfork. Um, you know, those guys who are just huge and tough and are so good at clogging up the middle that it opens the sacks for everybody else. And, and maybe he's, you know, I, I don't want to say he's Aaron Donald. He's not going to be Aaron Donald, clearly. But maybe he's just that huge load of a defensive tackle that can just push up the middle and ruin the whole thing. Well, listen, don't get me wrong. I'm not – I never, ever speculate. Ray knows this. I never, ever speculate on a young guy what he can be or what he can become. There's so much of that that goes around. It, it just really kind of ticks me off. Because until, you know, you can measure what's in a guy's heart, what's in his head, what his motivations are in, in this game, you can't say what he can't do because you don't know what he's willing, how hard he's willing to work to sure. change it all around. Yep. I just think that, you know, when you look at a guy like him, you know, there is tremendous upside there. Because when I look at him, I see this little baby face. I see this little jovial kid, you know who probably has a mean streak in him because he's always been bigger than everybody else. I saw, you know, the piece that ESPN did on him. You know, his mom actually dropped him off, you know, to play football. He really didn't want to play, and she kind of pushed him to play. Um, and it's amazing to me because I was having a conversation with someone, Ray, just recently, and they were they were asking me, what, if, what was it like to play with Reggie White? I was like, listen. Um, God knows what he's doing when he gives certain talents to certain people. I said, because if he would have gave me Reggie White's talent, or I'd have been ripping people a new ass every day, all day, and talking about it all the time, okay? I said, Reggie White, was a, was a he was like a big kid, you know? All Re Reggie wanted to do Rodney Dangerfield impressions and tell jokes and, you know, um, you know, he wanted to be a, a WWE wrestler, Randy Savage and, and Hulk Hogan. I mean, he was like a big kid. He was a big kid. I said, and the only time that you, the, the only mistake I've seen people, I've seen probably three guys make the mistake of pissing Reggie off in a, in, in a game and in a practice. And trust me, th when he said Jesus is coming, oh, Jesus was there, okay? And it, it was not pretty. And, and, and all because, you know, they disrespected him. And he disrespected who he was. Seth, you're talking um, about the scrimmage against the Lions, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was pretty I, memorable. I, no doubt about it. No doubt about it, Ray. But when I see a Jordan Davis, this is what I see. Now, I, I can't, you know, Reggie was faster than me. You know, so obviously Reggie ran faster than Jordan Davis. I mean, when I came out of college, I was running four five five. This kid is 6'6", 341 pounds, running a 4'7", 3". Um, and he looks like a little baby Huey. He looks like, you know, if you feed him a little gunpowder, you know, you cattle prowl him once a week, oh, man, you got something on your hands. But I'm not saying that he can't be that, right? I'm just, you know, my, my, my thing is the yesterday defensive tackle and the today defensive tackle it's two different games because, you know, teams are going to throw the ball 60% of the time. And then, you know, if you want to talk about, hey, um, oh, you know, we're going to move to kind of a five-man front. That gives me the impression that that's what they're going to do when you draft a Jordan Davis and then you sign a, a Hassan Reddick. Right. You know, we're going to see a lot, of, a, a lot more five-man fronts. Now, it gives them a lot of flexibility because Hassan Reddick – can line up off the ball. He can line up on the ball. You can't line him up on the ball as a defensive end, you know, for 50, 60 plays a game at 6'1", six, six 235 pounds and think you're going to get away with it. But it gives them a lot of flexibility. They can play unders. They can play overs. They can go to a three-man line. They can go to a four-man line. They can shift from three to four-man. There's a lot of flexibility and a lot of things that they can actually do. 
Um, but I guess the conversation, you know, is okay. You took him. Is he going? Can he evolve from being a two down player to a full time, you know, pass rusher slash run stopper? Um, and I guess that was the crux of this guy's article: is that the Eagles gave up three later round draft picks, three day three draft picks to move up two spots for a guy who's primarily a run stop. Yeah, well, I think a lot of this um, whole discussion kind of gets back to something that you and I talked about not all that long ago, right after the draft. Um, a lot of this falls in the lap of the defensive coordinator. You know, a lot of this falls into the lap of Jonathan Gannon, and we find out how good a coach he either is or isn't. Because you've got now, this year, there were certain limitations with the personnel he had last year. I'm willing to give him that. But you've got three players that you've picked up now since the end of last season that are very talented players with very specific sets of skills uh, but need to be used the right way to maximize that. And Jordan Davis is certainly one of them. Hassan Reddick is another one of them. And N'Kobe Dean is another one of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are three super productive players, but they have to be used and deployed in the proper way. And so if Jonathan Gannon was a little short on cards to play with last year, well, he's not now, but he has to play them right. And I think this is a year, because at the end of last year, Seth and I both had our questions about Jonathan Gannon. I mean, really, how good a coach is he? What what does he represent? We heard all good things, but over the course of last season, yeah, there were some real questions. But now, okay, he's clearly getting better players to work with. Got issues in the secondary, I'll grant you that. But in the front seven, he's got a lot of he's got a lot of weaponry. And let's now see how good a coach he is. So we're gonna close with this. Um, because you know, the quarterback is always the most important player on the field. Um, a couple of players that Nick Sirianni was impressed with um during the rookie camp. Um, and obviously Jalen Hurts is the guy. Um, they want to see if he can be the long-term guy. But the Eagles signed an undrafted free agent quarterback out of the University of Nevada, um, Carson Strong. And throughout um, the rookie minicamp, you know, um, Nick Sirianni has some pretty glowing words for him. Things like, you know, strong arm, um, smart. He, he grasped the playbook and was very in control, um, understood the verbiage. Um, he's sharp and got great tools. Now, guys, I'm gonna let each one of you, I'm gonna let each one of you have a run at this. I'm gonna start with Glenn. That is a recipe, okay, for a whole swath of, con of conversations. If Jalen Hurts stumbles an iota after that ringing endorsement, after one rookie minicamp, okay, and that segment of the fan base and media that believe that Jalen Hurst is not the guy right now, what does that create? Well, I think the issue with Carson Strong, so it begs the question of if all of this is so true, why was Carson Strong not drafted, right? They went all those rounds, he wasn't drafted. And I asked this question of Ray uh, a couple days after the draft. And I'll give a short answer and let Ray expound on it, but the answer is, He's got a knee that is ready to explode or two knees that are ready to explode. It's not an issue of talent with him. It's an issue of whether his body is going to be able to stand up through a game. Um, so, Ray, I'll, uh, you know, I'm answering Seth's question by saying that you answered that same question for me. Yeah, uh, and we had um, we had our Cooper doc on our show. <laughs> Every week we have a call from a doctor, uh, an orthopedist from Cooper Hospital, uh, who comes on to answer whatever the – sports injury question is of the week. And last week when he came on with us, I asked him about Carson Strong um, because you're right. I mean, everybody, the evaluation of him, I mean, I gave him a, I gave him a fourth round grade. Uh, I knew that there were, I knew there were injury concerns, but his production at Nevada was really good. Uh, completed 70% of his passes two years in a row. Uh, and I actually thought if you watched his tape, you could make the case that he threw the ball on all three levels better than any other quarterback in the draft, better than any of them, I thought, in terms of accuracy. But then when I began finding out when he fell completely out of the draft, 
Then I said, I got to look into this. And then I went back and I, I looked at the medicals and his medical is really bad uh, on his right knee. Uh, he had a really bad injury. They thought it was a career ender in high school. Um, caused a lot of colleges to back away from him. He wound up getting a ride at Nevada. He went there uh, and played and got injured again. Uh, had another knee reconstruction uh, before his senior year and came out and made it through. But um, the, the, the pros at the combine um, put him through all the medical tests, had their doctors examine him, and pretty much every team just wrote him off as a medical risk. I mean, for a guy that was a really productive college quarterback in a year when there weren't very many great quarterbacks coming out, everybody passed on him. So, Seth, it's all about his knee. Uh, and can he throw the ball? Absolutely. Can he, uh, does he show that he's smart and could play in the pocket? Um, absolutely. Uh, but the question is, I think everybody just looked at the doctor and the doctor said, there's no way this guy can have an NFL career. He's just, he's literally, he's literally one false step or one big hit away from being done. Wow. All right. You heard it guys. Well, that's the show for today. Um, Glenn, I want to thank you for your time, my friend. I want thank to thank you, Michael my pleasure. Mark for for joining us, and of course, the man of the hour, the man of the show, Ray Didinger. It's always a pleasure, man. I want you to know that you know you're my friend, you're my colleague. I love you, man, and um, all the best to you and Maria in your in your retirement, my friend. Well, well thank you, Seth. You uh, listen. Don't be disappointed if. Uh, if I call into the post game show once or twice this year, you know, I, I know the governor, the governor calls in every week. So you may have him on line one and me on line two. Okay. Be careful. Cause if you call at the right time, you know, they'll pat you in and have you doing the, doing the show remotely <laughs> via the phone. You know that, right? Yeah, I do know that, <laughs> but everything, no. everything you everything you said about the, the respect and th it's right back at you. I mean, I've, I've so enjoyed working with you. You have taught me, uh, a lot of football and uh, you have made every Sunday during the football season an absolute joy. And uh, um, I'm really going to miss, I'm really going to miss those Sundays, Seth, but thanks for the last five years. You got it, my friend, same right back at you. And we'll be seeing each other. This is, this is just, you know, goodbye for now. Um, that's the show for today, guys, as always be good to each other and take care of each other. Most importantly, make sure you love each other and, um, We'll be right back here next week, same place, same time with another show. And Ray and Glenn, Michael, always tell my guests our most important commodity is our time. I appreciate your time. Being our pleasure. Show. All right. Thank make you, sure you guys, Make sure you guys are clicking that like button. Make sure you go and you subscribe to the Seth Jordan Show on YouTube. I will see you guys right back here next week. Be good to each other. Take care. Peace.